I was 10, 11, 12, I don't remember, in line for the movies. And my, there were two guys in line in front of us, like three or four people in front of us holding hands. And my mother pulled me to her, not my siblings, just me, and looked at my father and said, they're weird. Which just made me look at those guys and I went, oh, now I get it. I'm weird like they're weird. And, and I looked at them and I thought, they look happy, they look like they're in love. Um, I'll be fine. Inform brings you incredible stories. I left two days before the revolution. It killed me so hard. James has never experienced the taste of fruits that haven't been attacked by pesticides, just like he's never experienced a neighborhood that hasn't been attacked by bullets. Some things just go hand in hand. People say what's on their mind. I think that it is a, um, a cardinal sin to lie to the American people um, about war. Partisanship is a version of narcissism. In downtown San Francisco, the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum curates events that bring you face to face with the world's changemakers. One third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s were made as a result of the birth control pill. Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. Since 1903, the most innovative leaders have come to the Commonwealth Club to share their vision. Sharing cars, sharing their homes, sharing, sharing a shared dream, a shareable American dream. That could work. You each can play a role in helping us chart a better future. Housing and health and education and policy all live close to the surface in us when our children are murdered. It's all the same story. We bring together the visionaries shaping the emerging trends in technology. It was a combination of instant and telegram. It was the idea that you could take a moment in time and you could capture it and you could just send it out and broadcast it with the entire world. I just threw the site together in about a week when I was at school. Oh, great. We've got angels, we've got incubators, we've got accelerators, we've got seed funds, we've got crowdfunding. We eat. We drink. <laughs> One of our first dates ever, we pickled like 100 pounds of herring and made 300 Definitely pounds of nerds. sauerkraut. Wow. Yay! Yay! We never shy away. 75% of the people of this country want universal health care and expect it. And damn it, let's go. Concentrated, deep, slow, loving, tender, passionate, sex. Whether you want to be on the cusp of current events or feast on pop culture. I should have a great time writing. I should write a book that is as fun as any party I'd be skipping. Inform events are fun and action-packed. I have a sh an anthropology scarf that does that <laughs> twisty thing, so. Come feed your mind and soul and celebrate the future with Inform. I love San Francisco and every time I come back here I remember that this is the only city in America that has magic. Hey, good evening. Welcome to today's virtual program with Inform at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Alexis Madrigal, staff writer at The Atlantic Magazine. Today, I could not be more pleased to be in conversation with my old friend, Roman Mars, and my slightly newer friend, Kurt Kolstedt. Um, they are behind the very popular podcast, 99% Invisible. Um, if you're watching this, you probably know about this show. But of course, it is one of the great podcasts, one of the great um, shows that not only has sort of shown people how to see uh, the world around them, the physical world around them, but also I think has really shaped the course of podcasts in general and the kind of um, uh, really not even Renaissance, but just sort of the explosion of, uh, of podcasting that we've seen over the last 10 years. But today Roman and Kurt are here to discuss their new book, The 99% Invisible City, A Field Guide to the Hidden World of Everyday Design. And today is the very day on which this book is coming out. So we get to uh, be their lead off event. And I, I couldn't be more excited about that. Um, if you'd like to ask them a question, just ask it uh, in the chat if you're watching on YouTube or in the comments if you're watching on Facebook. And now I need to ask the obvious but actually like quite important question, particularly for, for you two. 
you've got 99% Invisible, kind of the media brand. You've got this podcast that is downloaded by millions no. of people, people. Yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, and nobody reads books. So why did you write a book? <laughs> <laughs> I actually am like very curious about this as a book writer myself, but I, I just, yeah, what, what drove you to want to put something like between covers? Well, I mean, to, to begin with, I mean, the show has been on for 10 years as of last month. And, um, and there's something about the linear format of audio storytelling, which is something, it is the, I think the most superior form of communication known to humans is audio storytelling. <laughs> but there's something limiting about it, which is if you remember that at some point I told you some story about curb cuts and you'd have to go, was that three or four years ago? And let me look on the website, which is completely functional and beautiful. And you can search for things and find things on the website. But do I have, you know, 25 minutes to listen to that story and take it all in? Or, you know, you know, maybe we could just break apart all this knowledge and this worldview and this approach to the world and present it in a book so you can peruse it, so you can go through it, can you, so you can like flow through it and have it all in front of you. And then the other reason why was like about three years ago, Kurt was like, here's an idea for a book. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he had the will and the drive to do it because I couldn't push it forward by myself in any way, shape or form. And so it's this, both this sort of like, I just kind of felt like the, 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 the sort of the, we kind of demanded this in this moment, like the sort of design necessitated it to be in a different format because of how much information and stories we had out in the world. And then it was just a matter of getting it done. And that's what, you know, like, that was what the, yeah. the role Kurt was. So Kurt, as you were, you know, trying to sell Roman on this idea of a 99 <laughs> PI book, um, what were the sort of books that you were looking to, right? Because we, one, one can imagine that you guys doing a book that has 10 total stories in it, or one can imagine something that's basically an encyclopedia, you know, with like, um, I, I was imagining this, you know, like with all the, all the things alphabetized, you know, and like, yeah, curb cuts and, and then, you know, um, claustrophobia or actually those would be in the other order, I suppose, but you know what I'm saying. And there'd be all the different things that you all have covered through time. Um, so what, what were you looking at, Kurt, to kind of give you a sense of like what the shape of this book might be? I mean, one thing that's been on my shelf for, I guess, decades now, definitely since architecture school, <laughs> is uh, How Buildings Learn, Learn by uh, Stuart Brand. And- Such a cool book. It's such a great book. And it does and it does this balancing act of telling these specific individual stories, but also tracing this like larger arc so that you can kind of pick it up and flip to a page and read something, but you can also just read it all the way through. It works both ways. And and to me, that, that was always something that was important to me was that it should work like a book that you could read cover to cover. But as Roman was saying, it can also be a kind of reference guide. Like you can, you can say, I saw that in the book. Uh, I'll just check the index or I'll flip to that page or whatever. And, and each of these entries is sort of self-contained as well. Yeah. I love that idea that, um, you know, like a lot of coffee table books, you know, they're designed for sort of like flipping, but, I, I think it's an introduction to the book. You guys talk about wanting people to maybe like follow their own like paths of desire through the book. Yeah. Um, and why don't we, I, I'm going to try and sprinkle in a few of like the little stories uh, <laughs> from the book. Uh, so just to kind of like give it the flavor of, you know, all these like fun things. So why don't you tell us about what paths of desire are? Well, desire paths are just the, the, these paths that people take that are not designed for them to take. So if you can imagine like a sidewalk with a 90 degree turn coming up ahead, but you see this vast expanse of lawn that's directly to your side, you know, and you could just, you know, just cut across that lawn to get to the place you want to go to. Maybe it's the entrance of a building, you know, maybe it's something else. Maybe you just want to take a different path with the grass underneath your feet rather than concrete beneath your feet. But once you take it once, um, you tramp down the grass a little bit and then someone sees that and they tramp down that grass and then it becomes this little rut of dirt. And then it, and that's, that's a desire path and you can see them, they're reinforced by other people. And we're kind of fascinated by those things because they, they exhibit something really kind of special and, and sort of fundamental to 99% Invisible, which is a design intent and then like a practical usage and how those two things collide and how they talk to each other. And that whole interaction, that conversation between 
what a, how a person lives in a city and how a city is designed is what makes cities amazing. That's why you can do a book uh, like, like this one that's 400 pages and probably do, you know, a thousand more of them that are 400 pages long because that interaction is so rich with, uh, you know, just telling us who we are as humans, you know, through the lens of the things we build. Yeah. I want to talk about, you know, the design intent here a little bit, um, only because you, know, you look at just the sections of the book, right? Um, and oftentimes, you know, sections of books try to be um, parallel to each other. You know what I mean? So your sections of the book are inconspicuous, conspicuous, infrastructure, architecture, geography, and urbanism. And I kind of puzzled, I looked at it and I was kind of like, wait a second. Like, you know, I kept, I was like, uh, you know, writing, writing things on the wall. Like, what are the connections between those particular words and why that order? And how, was that like sort of an evolved system or did you go into it going like, you know, these are, th these are like the, the sections that we want here. Let me stand back and let Kurt take this one. <laughs> this was a thing I'll, I'll pull on my sword for this one. Um, so there were sort of two parallel ideas, right? One was to organize things by topic, right? As you would, architecture, geography, urbanism, et cetera. And this other idea that we had very early on was this, this dichotomy of these things that are sort of visible and invisible. And it, what eventually kind of came together in all of this was that it's sort of like the first two chapters set you up for the rest of the book, right? Like you get to sort of see the things that are designed to be, that are everywhere and sort of visible and you get to see the things that are more invisible and it kind of puts you in the right headspace to go through these more topical things step by step. Mm -hmm. At least that's how I see it. <laughs> yeah, and I, w we were talking about this endlessly and I was like, Kurt, no one's gonna notice which chapters are what. Just <laughs> <laughs> I noticed. So, of course it was you who, who did. <laughs> Um, you know, I, one of the things that I, I think is, is really interesting about thinking about, um, uh, a book like this that, you know, you know, isn't, you know, cause you, you pick up a, a book that's more of like an atlas or a field guide or, or, or something like this. And you know that you can go through it in, in different ways. Um, how did you kind of try and signal to people where they might dive in, like kind of provide these, you know, in, in a, in magazine making world, right. You might have like the front of the book and you'd have like different entry points for people. So, you know, some things about magazine, you kind of want, you know, a big picture here. Like, how, how did you, because I know that you guys were also just very involved in the actual design um, of the book itself. So how did you think about, like, where to set people off on a, on a particular path, aside from the traditional kind of chapter, you know, page one to page 400 structure? I mean, I think, I still think mostly that people go through it in order. I, I'm kind of like, that's the way I, I do things, but we just sort of gave them the permission to move around, knowing that there was some density to it. But what I, what I do, it, what's very clear is each of the stories really do build on each other. And one of the things that we adjusted in the process was we originally had, had like truly joining sentences where it would hand off to the next essay. Like it would almost introduce the next essay. And um, this was something that when we sent it to our editor, Kate Napolitano at HMH, she was like, don't do this. <laughs> she, was like, she, was like, she was like, if people are following that path, they'll read the next one. So they don't need to be introduced to it. And if they're not, this is just a distraction. This is just bad. And that was really revelatory for us. Because I, you know, like as a radio person, I think about segues all the time. And all I want to do is have a clever uh, segue. And I talk to the post and then the beat goes up. And then I go, to, you know, like, this is how I think about the order of things. And so... A lot of it was thinking through, like allowing that, um, you know, letting go of some of that control to allow people to do things more than, more than like guiding them. Because in a linear audio format, you're, you're completely the guide. There's almost no way for people to skip around. Mm -hmm. and so, um, so yeah, that was, that was like a big, big learning process for me personally. Yeah, and I will say too, that we do have a visual hierarchy. So, yeah. I mean, you can literally look at the spine of the book <laughs> And you can see where the chapter breaks because we have edge to edge printing. And so like, that's one way that you could like literally just, you could be like count down and go to chapter four. And then every section has like a full page spread. Every chapter has a double page spread. So there is this kind of orientation 
so if you're flipping through, you can at least see like, am I entering a new area of the book? Is it a chapter? Is it a section? So you, you get some of those visual cues, but at the same time, they're not overwhelming. They're, and they're kind of interspersed throughout. Yeah. So um, I want to ask you about stories or a story, say, that was, you know, tremendous that you thought, but it from the show, from the show, but that didn't make it into the book. And as a way of talking about sort of what makes a 99 PI radio story. So let's talk about that first and then let's get, I'm just planning it in your head. This is where we're going. Uh, <laughs> the signposting, handholding here that eventually we're going to get to what stories got cut out of, um, out of the, the book from the show, even though they're a great story, but they didn't work in that format. So first let's talk about what makes um, a great 99 PI you know, radio story. Well, so what usually happens is that there's a, there's, the first thing is that there's a story, you know, so like it, it hinges around like a single action, a person has a character at the center of it. And we look for that first. And then I want there to be a bigger idea, like a design lesson that's pulled from it, that tells you something about the way people think about the world and how you, you should maybe think about the world as the listener. And then the, the other thing is that there's a, usually a takeaway cool fact, you know, like one thing that I think people are going to pull away from the story that is maybe not, you know, completely germane to the core of the story, but it's like, oh yeah, okay. The like, tweetable fact. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, and, um, and then the other part is that I kind of want you to leave the story with this ability to decode the world in a different or new way. So even if, we're talking about something that's uh, specific to a place like, you know, La Sagrada Familia or something, you know, like in Spain, you can still like think about, you know, what is religious iconography in your town and, and what does it mean and, and how these, you know, these forms affect us and, and what they, what they mean to us. And so it's, it has a way that we, I kind of want to unlock the mundane world through the stories, even if the stories are kind of exotic. That's, that's I, I, part of the 99 MPI story. I, I want to stay with this for one second longer, just because I, 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 how much did you know this was what a 99 PI story was 10 years ago? And how much did you just keep doing a bunch of stories and then kind of <laughs> post facto go like, oh yeah, that's what we do. Or did you, know, you kind of like have it dialed from the beginning? I, I mean, I've been listening for so long that it feels like you kind of knew that 10 years ago or, yeah. or at least close to it. I kind of did, actually. I mean, the, the, the thing that has changed, I think, is actually the, the hinging on a real story. Like, when it was four minutes long and on KALW in the morning, you know, um, you could get away with it being about an idea only. It's just like, hey, here's, uh, what are, what's acoustics like? Here's the acoustics of the San Francisco Public Library. And it, you know, like, actually, that one had a character that actually had kind of a story to it. It was like a short story, but it was a little bit of a story. But we could, you know, I, well, when I say we, at the time, it was just I. I could really just kind of talk about a thing in, in terms of like an essay form. It was more of an opinion column. And then when more people came on with, um, you know, different interests and varied interests, the one unifying thing is that everyone likes to tell a story. Everyone likes to hear a story. And so when the subject is architecture, which we have a very wide range of a producer on staff who cares uh, a lot or very, very little about the subject of architecture. <laughs> um, what the unifying thing is if we tell a story, it's all okay, you know? And so that became more, more paramount the more people were um, working on the show. That's interesting. So Kurt, I know that you went back through all the episodes. And in fact, because you're the digital director, you probably know the back catalog as well or better than anyone. Um, what do you see? Do you, like from, from your, where you sit, do you notice a big change in what has happened with, um, with the show or do you see more continuity there? No, I, I, I would echo Roman's sentiments. It's like, as it's expanded, you know, you get to, and when you have a staff, you have time and space to interview more people, to build out longer, deeper stories. So it's, it, it's kind of grown bigger, but also like, laterally <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, and then and then we have these things like mini stories at the end of the year where we kind of revisit the old format and we just tell a simple little thing like and often those are stories that failed the kind of story test right so turns out you can't make a 20 minute story out of that but it is a cool 
four minute conversation between a producer and Roman. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, right. so we kind of, we, we echo some of that vibe in, in these end of the year mini stories. And I think also in the book, right? It's like the book was a place where some of them are stories and have characters and some of them are just, can be just a few paragraphs just to give you this like idea of a thing that will hopefully blow your mind a little bit. So what, uh, and I want one answer from each of you, I think, on this. What was the best story that got cut out of the book just because it, it, it didn't make sense in this sort of, you know, zippy short book format? I mean, the best, it, that, okay, I wish I had an answer. I mean, the, 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 the thing is, is there was, a, there's a million, I mean, like, I would say most of the stories didn't make it in. I mean, I'm trying to go like one that, oh God, <laughs> All, all I can think of is the last three stories that we did because that's how. <laughs> I um, well, I've got a, I've got an easy answer for this okay, one. Good. Potemkin villages. So we have this section in the book on camouflage, uh-huh. and it started to spiral a little bit out of control. <laughs> and I started writing about like how you know an airplane factory in Seattle was draped in a fake suburb during World War II to like in case bombers flew over. And then I went into this deep dive on the, on Potemkin villages, which are like fake towns basically. And the, the legend is that this guy Potemkin basically had his minions construct villages along the river as the Empress was like doing this tour of the countryside. So that at each stop, there'd be this village and you'd think, oh, the countryside is thriving, but it was all a farce. And nobody quite knows if it's fact or fiction or whatever. But anyway, <laughs> uh, when I was sitting down and talking to Rowan about this, it was like, this section's kind of getting a little bit off of the, like, you know, invisible city. <laughs> right, and right. it was definitely a good thing that we cut it. Yes. But it was, you know, it's just like, I fall down rabbit holes and I just keep going. And sometimes they go a little bit too far <laughs> and need to be reined back in. So. An, an example of something that like sort of fits what 99PI is, but doesn't fit the idea of a field guide to the city is an episode like Breaking Bad News, which was about the design of telling people that they're going to die. And it was really this emotional, um, it, really deep and cool story about something that is a process, like really was honed and designed. And we wanted to tell that story but it has no place in this. That's very much a 99PI story. It totally works for us. It's a little bit stretches the idea of design to be sure, but it's how we view design, but it wasn't, it didn't have a place in the book. I mean, and there's so many examples like that, that, that just made no sense. Yeah. I, I think as a long time listener, it does feel like the show's initial focus is maybe slightly huge, slightly closer to like the built environment and kept, has kept moving further and further away to sort of, if there's a space and there's an intent, there could be a story for an NPI <laughs> there if it right. has the right characters and, and the, the right things. I mean, like, I, I thought, you know, um, you had you guys had an amazing episode on um, the sanctuary churches, for example. I mean, I, that's mm-hmm. like totally like, I, I, it's kind of like an old 99 PI story, but it does feel like it was sort of this evolution of, of the form, particularly after 2016 when something yeah. happened. Um, you know, things <laughs> seem to move a little bit through time um, yeah. that way. Um, um, another, another one like that is like we did a whole uh, deep dive into the origins of Who Let the Dogs Out, the song. Oh, so good. Oh, God, that was so good. <laughs> yeah. Can like, you tell the people the story? Because if they haven't listened, even if you have listened to it, it's so delightful that you just want to hear it again. I just want to hear it again. <laughs> so uh ben sisto is a he, he did this sort of stage performance a sort of like a stage documentary about his investigations into the origins of who let the dogs out and what the the sort of i think what made the um the the story of the radio show or the podcast so good was that uh a he's super charming but what ended up happening is he's walking me through it and he's going, well, it's, it's this Jamaican man that did this. And it's this one that did this. And he gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And he blows my mind until he gets down to the point of like, there was a football chant recorded on a VHS tape in the 80s, which sounds like who let the dogs out. And each step, I'm just like more and more incredulous that it gets deeper and deeper, this hole of who let the dogs out. And it turns out somehow the collective unconscious wrote who let the dogs out. Yes. Well, like <laughs> yeah. 
It, it, it's existed for all of time. And uh, it's just coalesced in this one moment with the body. It's like ohm, but <laughs> who let the dogs out, you know, just sort of the baseline frequency of, of the earth. Yeah. And um, that's very much a 99 PI story, but that, that's, not, that's not a book story, exactly. So I, I, I do that. that um, I mean, that, that story was basically like, what is art? But, um, <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but via who let the dogs out. Um, so uh, one thing that's interesting is the, this is really about the city. And then MPI now spans, you know, outside the city. And, and you guys have posed it a little bit as kind of like this um, decoder for city topics. Um, and I think maybe you could start out with something that, th this is like the kind of cool tweetable fact, just as long as we're following the format here, um, which is gonna be about the invisible graffiti, about the like the utility codes. Um, so I, you know, people are probably familiar with this. You've been walking out on the street and you see, you know, there's some like spray paint with like, you know, some symbols and different colors. So like, what is that? You want to go, Kurt? Me? Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So I've been, I've been obsessed with this for years now, really. And turns out that those are markings that are put down to indicate what's underneath the ground, right? So it could be water lines. It could be power lines. It could be sewage lines and the colors reflect what the utility is so once you know the colors and it's different from place to place in the u.s it's one set of colors in the uk it's a different set of colors but once you know what the colors are you can decode that layer of it right and then there's the next layer of seeing like well there's an infinity symbol well it turns out that that means the start or the end of something even though it's kind of kind of intuitive right for like an endless symbol and and there are a lot that are kind of like intuitive once you get them, like HV for high voltage. And so I see these, I mean, they are everywhere and I am super aware of them. Like I, I watch for them all the time. I'm always sort of looking at the ground for these and I get weird looks when I like stop and take pictures. <laughs> um, but it's, but it is, it's this kind of classic thing. And part of what, and it's the entry, the, the sort of first entry of the book. And part of the reason we put it there is because it is this great example of decoding the city. It also has this fascinating kind of origin story of sorts, uh, where basically there was a big gas explosion and that really kind of set in motion people saying, okay, we need to standardize this system. We need to like make, uh, we need to make these decodable and standard across the country. Um, in order for people to not, you know, die in horrible accidents. So they're there for, for safety. There's sort of a story to it, but it's also very much a decoding the city kind of story. Um, we also need to have uh, at least one, maybe two local San Francisco stories. <laughs> um, because, you know, you're walking, you know, let's call it San Francisco Bay Area. Okay. Um, so, Favorite San Francisco uh, story from each of you? I mean, from the book, I think, I, I don't know if it's a favorite, but it's one of my favorite things. And it actually was one of the first interviews I ever did for the show, but it never turned into an actual podcast episode was about the cisterns uh, in San Francisco. I think they're the, those, those big brick circles that indicate that there's a, there's a large tank of water Underneath, it's it's built to be a redundancy in case of fire and emergency, because uh, we had some bad history of that. Um, and this is one of those ones where you know, like, it's in the middle of a of a of a chapter about water and our relationship with water and our infrastructure. And it's just one of those, hey, look at that thing. That thing's cool. You know, like, it's sort of like <laughs> it's a pretty basic uh, concept. And that's kind of one of the reasons why it never really made it as an episode, but it makes perfect for the field guide. You know, like these are things that give me great joy to notice and to point out. Right, and right. I always think when I drive over one, when I look at one, I always notice it. And it always gives me some degree of delight. So that's a very San Francisco thing that most places don't have that sort of structure. I, I'll, I'll pick the Transamerica Pyramid Oh. which was an episode yeah uh or was it an episode uh i can't remember when it was certainly before i joined the show it's the, it's the third episode maybe the third episode oh my gosh yeah 
And so it was a real pleasure to sort of dive into that, flesh that out, and like, and it's a really fascinating structure. And I'll be honest, I never really liked it until I listened <laughs> to that episode. Like it, that episode gave me new appreciation for this building. And what was it? What was it about the so, episode that made you right. that made you like it? So, so the the kind of key to this building is that it has blocks, you know, coming and going on all sides, like most buildings. But it also has this one road that comes in at an angle. And yeah. when you're viewing it from that angle, it's this Which is Columbus, building. I think? Columbus Avenue, yeah. yeah. Columbus Avenue. And when you're viewing it, when you're coming down Columbus Avenue, it just works. Like, it looks <laughs> cool. And, like, the thing... And I don't, I don't think we ever really have ever known for sure if that was an intentional design. Yeah, I think it's intentional. I mean, but but there's so many things about that design that was just offensive to people at the time <laughs> when it was made. You know, it was in the height of modernism and there was this 200 you know, foot, you know, uh, like conical, you know, the, to make the end of the pyramid is 200 foot of wasted space. And in, in modernism, wasted space is like, is like anathema to their very existence. And so it just, it offended people at the time. And then it was like this gigantic building in North Beach, which had no buildings over three stories tall, you know? And so everyone really, the AIA of San Francisco hated that building. They, they were against it, they fought it. And then, you know, what it showed up, you know, in, then 30 years later, it becomes an icon and they call it one of the best buildings in the city. Well, but, and that's the thing. I, I love buildings like this because it's like the Space Needle in Seattle, you know, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, like all these buildings that just cause so much anger when they're erected and go on to become icons of the city. And you can't really imagine the skyline of San Francisco without that building. It would, yeah. it would be kind of nondescript. So you're saying the Salesforce Tower is on its way to uh, great renown? <laughs> I'm going to reserve judgment on that. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, my guess is no, but you know, what, so be it. I, I think yeah. it could be more. I'm, I'm a, I'm a Sutro Tower man myself. I yes. Think. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. I think so that's a work of art. So, you know, this, you obviously worked on this book. That did It was must have been in the can by the time the pandemic hit. Right. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. close to it. Very close to it. it. Pretty close. It was certainly like everything had been drafted, at least. You know, there were still fact checks and edits and things, but yeah, yeah, yeah. there was a, a version of it that existed. Yeah. When you look at it now, like through the pandemic lens, um, are there things you would have done differently? I mean, given, uh, you know, the sort of vast weirdness of urban space right now? I mean, no, actually, the thing is, is like it is it is a product of its time and that's fine. But I think one of the things that was sort of most striking about its release now is how apt it is for this time. And, you know, like in this moment where we can't travel and we can't explore new places, we have this field guide to deeply exploring your own neighborhood, which is what we're allowed to do right now. And you can travel through this thing like you can you can use the, you know, the manhole cover in Berkeley or Oakland or San Francisco to jump on off, jump off to ex explore the Japanese manhole covers that, that, that were, that exploded in, in color and artistic, um, you know, presentation in the 1980s. And you can look at your city blocks and you can, it can transport you to the Champlas of Barcelona, you know, like it, it's really like a travel guide for this moment. So in a way we couldn't have designed it to exist in a better time than right now. Which is, which is strange, you know, like that it was definitely not the intent. And I would say too that the, in the final chapter, there are some things that, uh, you know, when, when we wrote it, I wouldn't have thought they would be especially relevant to necessarily everyone, like parklets and taking over parking spaces and streets and converting them um, that are now really relevant. And, and so topically too, like some things that, you know, I, I thought we'd be introducing to people to, it turns out we're going to give people context for something that they really have already encountered. Yeah. I mean, there's a street probably like in Houston where they took over the street for a cafe to exist. That's a place in Houston. They don't take over streets lightly, like they, <laughs> they like their streets. And, and, um, and they're going to see this thing called parking day. And, you know, that we talk about in, in the book and, it's not going to seem like some, you know, like hippie lefty thing that San Francisco does. Now the world does this thing and, and it has greater relevance to people because right now we're experimenting with cities in a way that we 
really haven't in a long, long time. And I think the book is, serves as a guide to that as well. Like it, we, you know, we there's a long history of how cities are and got to way that got to the way that they are, and we describe a lot of that stuff. And what it gives you the it gives you the mindset that sort of like un anchors you to this idea that thing, cities have to be a certain way. They have changed a lot and they're gonna change a lot right now. And it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens next. What do you think is gonna happen? I've actually just been dying to ask you this in general. I mean, I have lots of fears and I have lots of, I have some hopes, but I have lots of fears. My big fear is that we were about to hit this point where I think public transit is gonna really hit its moment. And then, you know, now BART, BART ridership is down 90%. And it's really painful to see that happen. Um, I don't know when that comes back. You know, like, I don't know when, you know, like mm -hmm. when people have an abundance of caution and they, they want to do what's right for what a city is. What's going to happen? I mean, my own, you know, the staff of the show is spreading out across the whole country right now. And so what does that mean for, for cities? I think cities are vibrant and interesting places. I don't think they're one thing though. You know, like I don't think of New York when I think of a city. I think of it as, I think all, all kinds of cities, uh, you know, from, you know, 10,000 people cities up to multi-million people cities. Um, so public transit is the one I'm worried about. I sometimes wonder, I wonder about elevators, like mm -hmm. who's gonna feel good on elevators or tall buildings gonna feel weird again? I mean, there was a time period where the top floor in a building was the least desirable floor of the building because elevators didn't exist. And so um, it took a real effort of marketing to make the penthouse into a thing. And that was, it had to be the elevator was the thing that made that possible. And so um, I'm curious about that. I don't know, there's a bunch of me. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I, my, my hope is that, you know, again, hearkening back to How Buildings Learn, which is a book about how buildings change over time. I mean, best case scenario, as I see it, is that we take existing buildings and spaces, we figure out productive reuses for it. And maybe there are fewer people going into offices, but maybe that means there's more office space that can be converted into residential space in a country that desperately needs a lot more housing, and affordable housing. So um, I'm really into adaptive reuse and kind of evolving designs and I would love to see some some of that repurposing going on. And I don't know that that's gonna happen. I'm not making that a prediction, but optimistically, I hope that'll happen. Mm -hmm. it's a, it at least seems like it's a possibility. Like we can take that road maybe. Um, we certainly can. It is really up to us if we you know, so desire, we can sort of force people to do it. I, I don't know what it's gonna be like. I know that there was a, you know, we've been in the middle of a construction boom in downtown Oakland where we work. And uh, I don't know who's filling those offices up when they're done. You know? Yeah. So I've been wondering the same thing, riding my bike around, like, <laughs> just like what is happening? Mm -hmm. um, is there an overarching argument in this book? Like, is it like, this is the argument of this book or <laughs> something else? I mean, I don't know if there's an argument so much, but I think of it as like, there is a joy in noticing that that's sort of the basic takeaway. And even if you're noticing something that is an injustice, there's a joy in being armed to recognize that injustice. And so that's what I take from it is, is that type of mindset. And I mean, I would say in terms of the trajectory of the book, it's like we take people through all of the things that exist, but we land on this note of all the things that could exist and all the ways that, you know, you can change your city. So you kind of, I don't know if it's, you know, an overarching argument of the book, but certainly the trajectory puts you at a place where you now know how to identify all this stuff and see the city in a different way. But you also might think about, you know, who is making the city the way it is? How might you influence the city to be what you want it to be? So I kind of hope that's where, like the very last piece is about, essentially reverse engineering desire paths, right? Like taking lessons from from a, a variant of a desire path and using that to reshape a city. And I I think that's a really, I hope that's that's a really powerful takeaway for people. I, th I think one of the reasons I was thinking about it is that, you know, 
I, I think, you know, Roman and, and Kurt and myself, we kind of came up at a, at a particular time in uh, media and sort of the internet where there seemed like, you know, you could just sort of recombine the existing kind of elements of the world and in a, in a not necessarily apolitical, but just not like that politics, like traditional politics were not sort of like foregrounded in a lot of the stuff that um, certainly that I was writing, but also I think early 99 PI too, it wasn't, it wasn't like an, ex, the, the politics of these things were, were not quite um, explicit. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like that moment ha has shifted a little bit. Um, I mean, and not just in 2016, obviously um, Black Lives Matter movement, you know, before the election and, and, and after it as well. Um, we're in a repoliticized moment. Um, and I, I just kind of wanted you to maybe think, think aloud uh, about sort of how the work that you had done in the past sort of intersects with this sort of, you know, re reinvigorated traditional politics. Well, so, so I, I can tell you, so the day after the election in 2016, okay, the staff had, was in the office in Oakland and they watched the election returns on a, on a projection TV on the wall. And I had to come in the next day and pick them off, pick them up off the floor <laughs> and tell them it's still worth doing our job. We, we still provide a service to people, even if it isn't um, as part of the direct resistance. And mainly because I think a thoughtfulness and care about the world is important, regardless of what is going on in the world. And so that is the, that is the sort of the, the ethic that sort of holds the show together. But we are humans who live in this world who make this show. So when stuff happens, you will hear it on the show. Like you will hear our reaction to it. You will hear, like you mentioned that Sanctuary episode. That's a historical example of the 80s of something that was really on our minds. You know, Delaney really pursued that story because there was this moment of sanctuary cities, and this is li literal, like church sanctuary. So we, we took the literal, literal interpretation of this thing that was going on in the news, and we went back and we did something historical to add perspective to the day. And that's kind of how we approach these things most of the time. You know, 99PI, it's pretty much a history show in disguise. You know? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's how, that's how I like it so much, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, but, but, but what points us to that history is what's happening now. And so this happened when, when the quarantine started, you know, we had shows lined up and the first one we did was me walking around my house, just describing what was in the house and little design stories of what a hallway was and what windows meant and things like that. And the idea was both to do a delightful fun show show that was reacting but also to place the show in the world so that when people got it it didn't seem like it was coming from mars <laughs> to, you know, mm -hmm. to play on words but it, did, it felt like it was this moment that was like that we had to we had to exist in the world to be relevant and so even though i wasn't really talking i mean i did eventually talk about the quarantine a little bit and and sort of make it a call to action that staying inside was an action you know but um but it was about you know just connecting with people and so the next few episodes we did after that were like about masks. They were about toilet paper. They were about what happens when the world stops and what are the scientific experiments you can do when the world stops. We have this weird opportunity right now. So let's look at, you know, what we can, what can we learn from it? And so in that sense, like we always exist and live in the world and react in the world. And it'll never be like, it's never really a show about politics, but you know, like, we can't help who we are. We're going to make the thing that's, it's a personal show, even if it's a bunch of us. Well, and in a lot of cases too, I think it's, it's, you might not see the thing of the day in the episode itself, but as soon as you listen to it, you, you know, it puts the day into a different context. So even if we're not mentioning what's in the news or whatever, it's like you, you, you get that there's, yeah. that we're speaking to something in the world. Mm -hmm. um, even if we're talking about something like sanctuary, you know, like going back 30 years and not necessarily talking about what's going on right now, mm -hmm. but, but we're talking about something that you know exactly, you know, what we're talking, what we're speaking to in, in the sort of day-to-day -day world. And, and there's weird things about chance, you know, like we did this story about this black paramedic corps in Pittsburgh that basically invented paramedics for the modern era. And uh, it started in the 70s. 
we started that episode about a year ago and it hit right at this moment where people were thinking about, you know, defunding the police and what are things, because the, the main culprit in that story was that when something happened, some accident happened, people called the cops and they were not the right person to do this. They were not EMT trained. They didn't know how to take care and stabilize people. They just got people to the hospital. And this group of black men from Freedom House became like paramedics. They invented the term in that moment. And and it came out in this moment where we were thinking about, well, what, what is the role of the police today? Like, what does it mean to have, you know, the police like handle everything? And maybe they shouldn't because they had that discussion in the 70s. And they came up with this thing that we think of as, you know, completely fundamental to our life in terms of an ambulance response unit. And there's probably a million things like that today that we think is handled by someone uh, like a cop or someone else that could be handled by a specialist and uh, could make the world a little bit better place. That that story started way before people. I, I don't think the term defund the police was in the popular lexicon at all, um, but it came up. And so sometimes that just stuff happens by chance. Um, we're going to go to questions from the audience um, in just a little bit. Um, but while I have you here, I do want to ask you a little bit about um, what you see in your in your podcast world and in your media sort of um, crystal ball. Um, you know, obviously that landscape has changed like a tremendous amount. Um, you know, we no longer uh, just have like Apple dominating things. Spotify, I feel like I listen to your podcast all the time on Spotify. Like the distribution landscape has changed. There's way more players. Um, and what, what do you what do you think about um, the changes in that podcasting world? And um, is it easier or harder to sort of make a living for this crew now than it was a few years ago? It's easier to make a living um, if you already have a show. I think it's harder to launch a show today, for sure. It's harder to get noticed. There's more shows out there. Having an established show when uh, an industry develops around you. And, and trust me, like the ind industry like developed like around me, <laughs> like, <laughs> like it may be something to do with me pushing it in some directions, but it was like, um, it, it's, it's a lot easier now in that sense, if you already have a show, but it would be really hard to launch a show today. Yeah. And you know, that the landscape of, of money and things in it, you know, there's some things that makes it easier. Some things that just, it makes it really, really hard. Um, um, COVID was tough, you know, like in terms of the commute changed the pattern of people listening. So it was, it was a little hard on the show, but we weathered it pretty well. Um, but now, you know, my MPI has, has 12 or 13 people on staff, you know, like, you know, yeah. like a podcast can support those people and pay them, you know, like a decent job, you know, decent wage yeah. in the Bay area. And that's an amazing thing. I mean, I was yeah. like in the beginning when I, you know, you know, managed to eke out like $30,000 in the show in a, in a year. Like I was shocked. So that's totally changed. I mean, my personal um, take on this has always been that podcasting is sort of the best format because you can have like a team of, you know, between three and 10 who are all just like doing something they really love together, you know? Mm -hmm. And like that is small magazines used to work like that. There's, you just cannot make a small magazine um, work in that way. And no website can actually make enough money at that size um, to, to do it. So you've ended up with this kind of, you know, there's like small, uh, like production companies that can do some video that works like that. And then, and then podcasts and, you know, where is there the most sort of like creative firepower right now, um, out there and like the most sort of innovative and interesting work. It's like in sort of that kind of documentary film and it's in the, in the podcasting world. And, you know, yeah. that's, it's, it's just wild that that's how you make really good stuff. And yet the media business essentially has no, um, no model for that anymore aside from these couple of things yeah yeah i mean it's hard for it to really really scale you know for in, in some sense like we've kind of tapped out of our ability to like you can only sell so many spots you can only put out so many episodes and so it's kind of hard to make it into the business that the newspaper industry was you know like uh you know you know 20 30 years ago but um i think you're right i think it's a great time to be you know like doing this i i, I mean i love the show i love the I love that people care, you know, like that was not a foregone conclusion 10 years ago. That's for sure. <laughs> um, let's do something really fun from the audience questions. Who designed the 99 PI challenge coin and what is the meaning behind the symbols? I think you guys <laughs> even have one there, right? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course you must. I, I didn't mean to like challenge you on the spot, but. <laughs> um, so yeah, Kurt, you, you had a lot to do with this one. Let's start. <laughs> yeah, so we, 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 we worked with much more. Um, the, those, those were the designers. We kind of, my first idea was that we might do like a callback to the, to the original challenge coin and have like a series of symbols. And Roman kind of vetoed that. And yeah. I and it, it, it and but it was a good veto um, because it led us to this right and so you know the front is a manhole cover and you can see like the little pick points like this is where you'd like leverage something in to pick up the man manhole cover yeah. and so that's great and then on the back it was like like it literally was like okay well what is something that's super quintessentially of the book of the show. Um, Oh, and it's round. <laughs> and so we do the the uh, the cisterns, right? The cisterns we were talking about earlier. So that's what this this circle, this inner circle, is is one of those cisterns. And Roman had this clever idea, and I don't even know if you'll be able to see this, but the, in the very middle, the cistern cover design is an echo of the front, right? So it's like it's like the coin is like embedded on the street. These people are kind of like walking over it. And it's like, well, they know. Oh. <laughs> um, oh, that's good. Yeah, and then arrayed around the edges are, of course, these utility markings that we were talking about earlier. Um, and Just so bring it all together here. Bring it all yeah, together. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of like it was like, well, once we have the cisterns in there, like the first thought was put the put the cisterns around the edge, right? And then it was like, well, what if, what if we move them in and then put more things in? So we tried to sort of make it interesting and varied, and so much more pulled in, you know. These, I believe, they're all actually from the uh, book, the yeah. first illustration of the book. Yeah, so so they literally just took took this illustration, which in turn was based on a photo I took outside of our office, and um, and put you know arrayed a series of these around the edge of the coin. That's awesome. Yeah, there is nothing that we uh, touch that doesn't have at least that much thought. To go into. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like it's exhausting. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I you you can tell though you can tell. Well, and yeah, is, and I and right. I truly love it too. And like, and we're both like this. And we at, at a certain point, I'll go like, oh no, I want to do it this way, and go. We we fight back and forth on it. And it's like it's and it makes the thing that I love. I mean, that's the thing. That's the, I mean, the result. This was the it. case with the book too. It's like totally. we we both came in with different perspectives, like different backgrounds. Like he's audio, I'm I'm more writing, and like. But when we talk it out, when we when we work together, I don't know. I think we come up with some pretty good things. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> um, do you all ha now have like a, a designated challenge coin manufacturer that you go to all the time? Is that <laughs> how did, this is working? We did for a while, but we got we got a new one with this one. So we just we, we sort of shopped around for this one because oh, wow. was paying for it. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a strange business. I mean, they you know like and and challenge coins are one of those things that. You know, we did a story about, and we sort of gravitated to, and uh, and people, uh, you know, associate us with them. Um, but uh, they're also associated with, like, there's a COVID, like Trump survived COVID challenge coin that that was announced today, and so there's some real unctuous stuff related to challenge coins. Too. Yes. Um, here's another good one from the audience questions. What was the design process for the book itself? Um, did you come to it with ideas to the publisher? Did you set them loose on the manuscript? I actually know the answer to this question and it's a really interesting one. <laughs> so <go ahead. laughs> um, we came with a lot of ideas and, um, and then we developed those ideas with the, with the illustrator, with the designer, um, Patrick and Raphael, and they made them better. Mm -hmm. And so like, for example, you know, with the illustrations, I nerded out and I made like this huge spreadsheet of like what illustrations I thought we should have and where and all this stuff. Um, and then we talked to Patrick about it and there was a lot of just kind of discussion about, okay, you know, given your style and how you approach things, like how do you want to execute this? And then we gave him some leeway too. We just said, look, if you're reading the book, and you find a spot that you think needs an illustration because you don't understand what's going on, um, then tell us and like, we'll just put an illustration there. So there was a lot of dialogue um, and, and like the design, like there's some surprises in the, in the design of the book that people will discover when they get it. <laughs> and Raphael gets a ton of credit 
for yeah. for making that work. Like he he figured out how to make it work efficiently and effectively, and to basically sell the publisher on like we can do this and we can do it affordably. It's not going to break the bank. Like he thought about how many colors we could use in different places and how to like optimize that use to kind of balance that like cost benefit equation and make this really beautiful thing. Yeah. It was really a, a fun team effort. I mean, my original idea that we had talked about was to have the, the kind of the logo of the, of the podcast and have like a, which is like a, it's a hundred square grid with a single yellow square. It's the 1% that's visible and to have it cover and then have that one little piece that's available. Um, and then, you know, we just heard from HMH and they're like, you know what, if we do that, those die cuts in, 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 um, on a dust jacket, they rip. And then people send them back and they don't buy them and it's terrible and people don't like that experience at all. And so it was like, Oh, okay, I can work with that. And then it's, and we were like, well, how, how, what size do you want to do it? And it's like, well, um, it can be some, you know, a different size. It's a little bit, it's a little bit larger, but it basically feels like a regular book. And, um, but it can't be too far off because, um, because it can't fit on Costco's, uh, uh, <laughs> and you way. want it in Costco for sure. Yeah. For sure. You know? <laughs> and so, so there were all these things we learned about the process that was, you know, kind of like, that working within constraints and, and to me, there's no good design that doesn't have constraints. And so that was, that was the fun part of figuring that stuff out. We yeah. were not experts in making a book. We had ideas, but HMH and Raphael Gironi and Patrick Bale, they, they turned those ideas into something usable. Yeah. The other thing you mentioned on the podcast too, is going through their portfolios, you know, like going through the illustrator and designers portfolios, which of course yeah. makes a ton of sense. Um, but uh, I just love that idea of kind of like working with the people that are, are on your team. And, well, not just and they to... both have such a range of work too. So we, like one of the first things we did was we said, we love your work, like, but here are the things that jump out at us as being like the direction we want to go. Um, so it was like a combination of looking at what they did and how they did it. And also saying, well, here are the things we think that, would apply to this thing that we're working on. And I even got a surprise when I got my copy in the mail. I didn't realize that the, that the text is embossed. Did you, did you, <laughs> did you know that? Yeah. I like picked it up and I was like, the type. <laughs> but I got a dozen design surprise when I picked it up. It's great. Yeah. Um, we uh, have a, a COVID question, sort of COVID related question. Um, which is from the audience, which is have previous disasters in history impacted design? I, I, I think we know the answer to that one, but you can maybe um, pick a couple examples. Uh, and if so, um, are there lessons and lasting effects on design in this case, not just like on the city, but on, on the practice of design, I think is the question. Yeah, I mean, I think the most sort of salient example that I can think of is the Chicago fire just like erasing Chicago and then they went forward and it kind of created the city beautiful movement of grids and regular things and you know like that was something that the plan there um, became the dominant form for a long time and you know sometimes it it hit it's hit cities and it kind of leveled it and recentered it but uh, sometimes they you know didn't like the Burnham plan for San Francisco never was enacted so um, usually those physical disasters is what we think of this type of disaster of, you know, of, of, of a disease, like, I think this is going to be interesting to see what happens. I mean, we definitely have had uh, different things in architecture where people have, uh, um, I don't know, those like, I think I've seen lots of things online of like, of people uh, dispensing wine from bars, you know, like through these little tiny holes that instead of, because people couldn't come in contact mm -hmm. with each other, those types of things. It'll be interesting to see if non-contact uh, forms of architecture become- There's more. also um, a great answer. I don't know if anyone here knows Richard White, who's a you know, historian down at, at Stanford. Um, and he wrote a, a great book about, um, well, he's written a bunch of great books, but one of them was covered that period in which um, lots of people, there were tons of disasters, the Chicago fire, there are all these floods or, you know, um, disease, you know, particularly waterborne illness um, sweeping through, through cities. Um, and I, I called him up one time and I was like, so what, what was really like the, the, the key to building infrastructure at all, like for cities, you know, particularly like public, like municipal, you know, like a whole water system, a whole sewer system. 
Um, and he pointed me to this passage in his book where he uh, describes um, the democracy of defecation, he called it, in which basically people realized they were like all in it together. Mm-hmm. That like you basically, the, the ship of the city had to sail, you know, all, all at once. <laughs> you know, you couldn't have part of the ship sailing and not the other part. Um, yeah. And I, I, so I thought about that a ton through this time. And I've also thought about uh, one of our guys, Ed Young at The Atlantic, Somebody told him, you know, disasters bring people together, epidemics tear people apart. Hmm. And I feel like there's these kind of, through this whole pandemic, there have been this kind of like seesawing between those two poles, you know, where you see people wanting to be like, hey, we're all in it together, we're all in it together. And at the same time, it's hard and yeah. and and someone can make you sick. You know, there, yeah. there are these things that are just very different from like if someone's like trapped in a building and you get to go be a hero. Instead, you have to just stay in your house to protect other people, you know? And I, it's, I think that's one of the th- reasons why this feels so unpredictable as a sort of what comes out of this, you know, because we've all kind of yo-yoed through these positions. For sure. Yeah, for and, sure. and I think a lot of it will only be obvious in hindsight. And like, I, I've been writing some articles recently again, not directly about the pandemic, but sort of with the pandemic in mind about like the origin of the bicycle and how a volcanic eruption halfway around the world inspired this German guy to invent the Laufmaschine. Why? Because horses were being killed for meat because people were starving and they needed a new mode of transportation. I've got a piece coming up about um, how the Great Depression gave rise to miniature golf, of all things. And... (laughs) And so, like, I cannot wait for that one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, I don't know. I, I try to kind of keep that in mind when I'm looking for ideas, too. Like, what, what, what could we think about doing in this moment differently? But also just realizing that some of these will be things that we don't know until after the fact. We won't know what's going to stick. And we'll look back, and it'll be obvious in hindsight, like the bicycle. But, but, but not obvious, you know, in foresight. Um, last really quick one, and then we're going to do a little rap question here. Um, but for Roman and for Kurt, favorite record cover from audience question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you can't, you, you, you can't get away from how great Unknown Pleasures is, uh, the Joy Division <laughs> record. And but I would say like the personal one, like I interviewed Dave King. He, he lived in San Francisco. He designed this, this logo for the band Crass, this anarchist uh, band. And the records for Crass were these fold out things you put on your wall. And they had all this like incendiary language and anarchism and and the Crass cross is beautiful and edgy and stencilable. Mm -hmm. And it's just this amazing thing. And and I had those up on my wall when I was a kid. And so I love the Crass records. Um, I'm gonna gonna, gonna cheat and self, I guess it's not self promoting, but, I'm going to cheat and say I, I really like the cover. Am I allowed to talk about this, Roman, of an upcoming? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> there's, a, there's an album coming out uh, from our very own Sean Riel. And I the cover conceptually and as executed, like, I just love everything about it. I, I think it's beautiful. And so that one, I guess, is not visible yet. Um, <laughs> but it will be. <laughs> So we're, um, we're putting keep on your eye out for it. That's your next 99 PI related merch purchase after the book. Sorry, I didn't mean to turn it into a I just, it's kind of top of mind right now. It is really no, beautiful. It's and good. Yeah, always about... be closing, Kurt. Always be closing. <laughs> you know, you gotta, <laughs> gotta get used to it for your book sales here. Um, I always, you know what I always think about with the album covers, that incredible project that uh, person did where they collected the white album, like a, a whole bunch of different versions of the white album. And it's kind of like this, um, you know, it was kind of an early design blog fave, you know, back in the aughts, you know, because it had, you'd see this like incredible um, selection of what happens to a fully white album cover through time. Yeah. You yeah. Can kind of put a story I love it. to it. And I, and I loved it because it's really not about the album cover. It's about the invisible time that that album cover has gone through. Yeah. Um, here's your uh, uh, informed traditional question to end things. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? Who wants to start? (laughs) Oh my God. Okay. So the, 
these are really hard for me, but the one I was thinking of, because this came up to me recently, was uh, I think that the, what would make the world a better place if by default, freezers were as big as refrigerators on the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> I think that this, this like 70-30 split is super bad and it doesn't fit the modern world and it should be 50-50. I'm, I'm for that. <laughs> I think that would make the world a better place. <laughs> also massively increase the amount of cryosphere, artificial cryosphere uh, well, on this earth. It would, absolutely. We have an episode about that. Too. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kurt, how about you? Um, I think the whole world should adopt tilt and turn windows. Oh. And uh, what a tilt and turn window is, is if you hold the handle and you pull it one way, it tilts back down towards you. And if you turn it the other way, it opens like a window or a door. And these things are all over in Europe. And I'm obsessed with them, and I have been for a long time. And they just, they make life better. They work in a variety of ways. They're, they're extra thick, so they have, like, good thermal properties, so they're sustainable. And I just think everybody would benefit from having one, of, from having all of the windows in their home be tilt and turn windows. <laughs> there you go. That... Uh, beautiful, true to form um, answers, <laughs> you two. Thank you uh, so much, Roman Mars, Kurt Colstead, for joining us today in Form at the Commonwealth Club. And we also just want to remind our viewers that their new book, The 99% Invisible City, is available now. And if you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Alexis Madrigal. Thank you, and have a great night, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Alexis.